Hello and welcome back to The Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we'll be delving into Season 6 and slowly moving closer to the famous No Way Out storyline. Season 6 is what I view as the transition period into the second half of The Walking Dead's grander story. As throughout the season, we slowly begin to switch from that original theme of purely survival, to a far more complicated story with more communities and conflicts that arise in them. So moving forward, this transition will be an overarching trend in the videos covering Season 6, though that will become much clearer as we get further on. And with that said, let us dive in. As usual, I like to start a new season with some pre-season discussion to give you a better idea of how the community and the entire franchise looked like before we went into the much-anticipated Season 6. And as always, we begin with the trailer. Very similar to what we talked about in the Season 5 videos, here too the producers decided to be more than a little cheeky and add lines to the trailer that never appear in the show itself. Remember that Morgan returning to the show was already done in a vastly different way. So when we suddenly heard of him supposedly trying to stop Rick, theories began to go wild. The premise here was that we would pretty much see a civil war within Alexandria, and there was more than enough evidence to back up such a theory. Based on what we saw of Morgan in late Season 5, his quote-unquote clear side was obviously gone and he had adopted some sort of more peaceful worldview. Then you combine that with the first thing he sees when he arrives at Alexandria, Rick shooting someone in cold blood. And then you add the lines in the trailer very explicitly saying that he knows how to stop Rick. And as if all of that wasn't enough, the main poster for Season 6 shows a very clear split between the Survivors and the Alexandrians, with Rick and Morgan directly opposing each other. And importantly, Gabriel here is on the side of the Alexandrians, which also fits in with his sort of betrayal of the group in the latter half of Season 5. And yes, there's even more. They even switched around some of the comic book moments to have lines like appear in the trailer. Basically, they were trying to do everything in their power to once again steer you in the wrong direction. And needless to say, many many people believed it. If you go back, there are quite a few articles written about the supposed civil war, which we'd obviously never see in the series. It's just one of those things that was super exciting to experience firsthand, as back then, trailers were much more stingy with the footage they gave away, not to mention that things like AMC Plus with countless early previews etc. did not exist. And sure, you can once again bring up the question of whether this sort of trickery should be done etc. But exactly as I said in the Season 5 videos, for a vast majority of people, I think the trailer for a sixth season of a show will by no means be a deal breaker. So as far as I'm concerned, it was simply a fun misdirection for those of us who want to dig into the nitty gritty. But one more detail that seriously raised some eyebrows was the appearance of Dwight in the trailer. Because usually, they only ever include scenes from up to episode 4. And so, this came as quite a surprise, and for good reason too, as the scene is actually from episode 6. Considering the entire No Way Out storyline was yet to even take place, Dwight seemingly appearing so so early made many wonder whether there might be some different angle to his character, especially because of how much him and Daryl are alike further into the books. Theories already began to go wild about Daryl potentially replacing Dwight later into the Savior arc, but more on that when we get there. And still speaking about the trailer, there's one last but very important detail I have to mention, and that is the fact that my main man Hosier finally appeared in the series. I've raved about music in this retrospective series before, but Hosier is still up there alongside the likes of Johnny Cash, Heike, etc, etc, as some of my favorite artists of all time. So trust me when I say that hearing Arsonist's lullaby in the trailer had me literally cheering. I'm still low-key mad that Take Me to Church never appeared in the show, but hey, at least this one did. 
and multiple times too. I'm guessing many of you will have at least heard of Hosier before, but I seriously recommend going through some of his more recent albums. They are absolutely stellar. And the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the story itself is the pacing of the sixth season. The thing with season six is that we heard news of Jeffrey Dean Morgan's casting as Negan before the season even began. So at that point, it was pretty much a given that we'd see him in the finale at the latest. And with that said, we knew that, unless there was some massive remix at some point, we were bound to get to issue 100 by the end of the season. Meaning that the show would have to go through roughly 23 issues in the 16 episodes. As far as the adaptation ratio goes, that is a very respectable 1.43 issues per episode. Not quite the insanity that was season 3, but all things considered, that is still a very, very fast pace. Which is made even faster when you account for some of the TV show exclusive episodes. And now more than ever, keep this in mind, as this will become very important in Season 7. Especially considering we've already peaked in terms of numbers back in Season 5. And unfortunately, Season 6 is the first ever premiere of the series to not surpass the previous seasons. And with all that said, let us finally get into it. The very first thing I want to bring up with this season is the experimental nature of the first episode. As we have multiple timelines moving in parallel to both follow up the immediate events following Morgan's arrival, as well as tell the current story of the Quarry mission. This sort of black and white approach was a first, and if memory serves me right, only time it appears in the show. And while we have had some episodes following multiple timelines at once since then, they did drop this black and white angle. Personally, I really enjoyed how it was handled, and it very efficiently removes any and all confusion as to what you're seeing at the moment. You can do hard cuts without the fear of losing your audience in the process, because it's blatantly clear whether we're seeing a flashback or the present. The episode is directed by Greg Nicotero, who's known for some of the more experimental and artistic episodes in the series, so this might have just been another one of his creative one-offs for the show. In terms of themes, his episodes vary wildly. Everything from episodes like No Sanctuary to The Day Will Come When You Won't Be. So he's very good at what he does, regardless of what the episode has to be. And not surprisingly, at least in my opinion, this is not an exception. Though with that said, let us move closer to the story itself. And put briefly, the entire quarry mission of diverting the walkers is a TV show exclusive storyline and basically replaces the horde we saw in Washington in the books. It's pretty much explained as the reason why Alexandria has had little to no walker troubles in the past, as they've just been naturally accumulating in the quarry. Only problem is, it is about to spill over. So now a plan is set up to divert them somewhere else. The order of events is also somewhat remixed between the two versions, as the walker troubles would be caused by the scavenger's attack, which we'll get to in a second. But in the TV version, it's rather the ongoing walker diversion mission that will be interrupted by the wolves. But I have to admit, my monkey brain prefers the bombastic and much more action-y version of the adaptation. And it's not just that, but I think it also works as a brilliant way to showcase how far the group has come. They've gone from being terrified of the walkers to understanding them, and to some extent, being able to kite them to ensure their own safety. It sort of implicitly answers the ever-present question of, Herder, walkers so slow, how can you not outrun them? Because we do very much see the group exploit their slow and dumb nature here. Of course, the plan would be foiled, but if it wasn't for those outside forces, it would have been a success, precisely because of how dumb the zombies are. It's the numbers that makes them dangerous. And also remember what I said about this being a sort of a transition period. Well, the way I see it, and we'll be talking plenty more about this in No Way Out, I feel like this is a sort of a final boss when it comes to the zombies in the series, as following this point, Walkers themselves would never be the core threats, neither in the adaptation or the book. They're still of course always there, but not like in No Way Out, where it's exclusively the zombies. 
Far later into the Whisperer War, for example, we'd get a sort of a No Way Out 2.0, if you will. But there too, it was more so a human versus human conflict, and the walkers being a weapon rather than just a force of nature. So yes, I do very much see this arc as the final battle against the Zambonis. Returning back in time for a bit though, we get to see Rick's and Morgan's initial interactions following his arrival in Alexandria. Again, keep in mind that there was an implicit assumption that there would be some sort of two-sided conflict here. So on initial viewing, for me at least, there was always that thought at the back of my mind that there's more to this than meets the eye. Obviously it would turn out to be pure lies, but as of now, we had no clue. But anyway, we begin to see some hints of Morgan's story after we last saw him, as he drops some hints about where he learned his staff skills. But importantly, we see a fun callback to the very first episode in the series. Look, I ask, and you answer. It's common courtesy, right? But here, we see the inverse of that, as it's Rick now quoting this back to Morgan. I ask, you answer. It's common courtesy, right? I don't really know how popular this was, but I always love these small details for the turbo nerds like me that latch onto every small little thing. Unfortunately, I think nowadays we don't really get much of that though. But with that said, let us pick up the books for a bit where things do take quite a bit of a different turn. Obviously we don't jump around in time as we do in the adaptation, so the book picks up exactly where we left off. And on top of that, the entire vibe is also a little bit different. We see Rick immediately revert to his police role of trying to calm people down and just telling them that everything is under control. So we get much less of that, you're all going to die without us vibe in the books. And following this, we see Rick making the rounds to make sure that this entire mess has been cleaned up. We see him go make sure that Jessie is alright, where we see her feel guilty that she feels relieved that Pete is dead. So Rick just comforts her and for now, that is that. We then cut to a very angry Douglas who's screaming at Rick that Pete does not deserve anything, let alone a funeral. And it's Rick being the more cool-headed one telling him that Pete is dead and that the funeral is not for him, it's for his family. And so, we do see the entire church service for both Pete and Scott, where Rick gives quite a long speech about how all of them have made choices that they are not proud of, and that it's this adversity to hardship that makes them who they are. To cut a long story short, he pretty much says that sure, Pete was a horrible human being, but asks what brought him here. Was he really just that, or was it the surroundings that shaped him into what he became? Though I'll be honest, in retrospect, this does feel a little weird coming from Rick. Even if it is in service of Pete's family. Because based on what we've seen so far, he's nowhere near as lenient when it comes to someone purposely harming those close to him. Would a person who did what they did to the hunters really tolerate someone who has hit their own kids? I don't think so. That may just be me because as far as I'm concerned, there's not a single thing you could say that makes Pete even remotely redeemable or acceptable for that matter. So maybe that's why I find Rick being so calm about the whole thing just weird. But regardless, the funeral is interrupted by a gunshot ringing out at the gates of Alexandria. Though before we get to that, let us tackle the adaptations version. Which changed this quite a bit, as both Rick and Deanna very explicitly say that Pete will not be buried within the walls. This is in line with Rick generally being quite a bit more cold and ruthless in these arcs in the adaptation, so this is just another example of that. They agree to take his body west and to basically just dump it there which is when we see Morgan and Rick come across the quarry in the first place. And importantly for the adaptation, Ron's role regarding his father's death is also quite a bit different. Because he is in his angst teen phase, he sneaks out alongside Rick and Morgan and almost gets himself killed. This would later play into Carl's character in both versions, so we'll talk about that a tad bit later. Another fairly substantial change, which I already alluded to before, is that they pushed the whole conspiring against Rick part way earlier in the adaptation. And the people involved are also changed. 
but we'll talk about that more in depth when we get there in the books. As of right now, the most important part here is just the fact that Carter is basically a TV show added character who takes the role of the main conspirator against Rick. Which is when we see the scene that the trailer made us believe that it would actually be Morgan. And the reason why I don't just say he's exclusive to the TV version is because he is mentioned in the book as someone who died because of Davidson's actions, but it's a name drop and nothing more than that. So a reference, sure, but a character, not really. Oh, and also fun fact, while Andrew Lincoln was getting into character for this scene, he apparently punched the wall so hard to actually put a hole in it. So hey, at least we know he's giving it his all. But jokes aside, I really love the scene in the adaptation. Especially with how nonchalant Rick is about the whole thing. I think many of us were very much holding our breath and expecting Rick to at least bonk him over the head or something, but when he says that he's fine, almost like Carter himself, you can finally breathe out. It was just a great scene that handles tension brilliantly in my opinion. This is also where Heath finally comes into the adaptation. And while his role for now is fairly minor, we do get the absolutely brilliant exchange between him and Eugene. He shows up at the gates, saying that they've been out on a run for the past few weeks. Where, as usual, we get yet another signature Eugene performance. I was just walking by, she asked if I could relieve her for a few ticks. I said no thank you, and she ignored me, which is obviously what I should have done, as it's been at least five ticks and still no Holly. I fully respect the hair game. I am so, so glad that Josh McDermott was given an even larger role than we saw in the book for these later seasons because his portrayal of Eugene has seriously never failed to deliver. Whether it's just these small, in the grand scheme of things, unimportant conversations, or his signature one-liners, all of them are just great. As we talked about in Season 5, another add-in for the adaptation is the character of Enid. So, absolutely everything in these episodes involving her is by default exclusive to the adaptation. And notably, we get a brief insight into how she ended up in Alexandria in the first place. And while this obviously does not make up for the time Sophia's had in the books, it does at least explain a little bit about why she's so detached from everyone here. Though yes, nothing remotely close to this ever happens in the books. And speaking of which, let us finally return to the book. We see the group rush out of the church, where Rick says for everyone to get into positions and prepare for what might come next. Remember that in the books, Andrea has already become a regular lookout for the group, so someone being at the gates without the group knowing beforehand already raises major red flags. Though just as Rick runs towards the gates, he's met with Derek, one of the scavengers. And it's also the first of a few times in the series where the now famous little pig, little pig, let me in line appears. Most likely, this is a reference to The Shining, where Jack says, little pigs, little pigs, let me come in. But yes, Negan would repeat the same exact line in both versions as well. But anyway, here we see an exchange sort of similar to that of The Hunters, where Derek tells Rick to let him in, etc, etc, while Rick calmly explains that that's not how it works, and that he actually had a chance of joining them naturally. That is, until a red dot suddenly appears over Rick's heart. Now threatening with a sniper, Derek repeats his commands, only for a gunshot to ring out in the distance. And as Rick goes to rub his chest, he realizes he is absolutely fine. And it's then when he smiles at him and calmly says, Looks like my sniper just got yours. Ready to start walking now? And following this point, all hell breaks loose as Andrea continues picking them off. Though when Rick offers them to stop this and simply leave, they refuse, which is when the rest of the Alexandria forces show themselves and just gun down their entire group. And that is the end of the scavengers. Only problem is, we cut over to the streets of Washington, where we see the Horde begin to move. And with that said, let us return to the adaptation, where instead of the scavengers, we have the wolves that were teased throughout Season 5. Remember that the entire Walker Diversion mission is still going on in parallel. 
So most of our heavy hitters like Rick, Michonne, Daryl, Abe, Glenn, etc, etc, are outside the walls. So the attack is already more dangerous simply due to there being less fighters within Alexandria. And also, they have the element of surprise that wasn't really present in the books. And I've gotta be honest, from a horror angle, the way they're revealed is absolutely a 10 out of 10. Earlier in the episode, Carol called out the other lady about smoking indoors, which... Yeah, by the way, seriously. Smoking is super cringe. You smell, you're making me smell, you are actively burning money as well as your lungs. Like, seriously, just, just stop it. Anyway, that's your Kuroto PSA today. We see her look outside of the window to see her smoking there. Only for her to suddenly get swooped by one of the wolves. So yes, smoking does indeed kill. But jokes aside, I still remember watching the episode for the first time and sitting there like, wait, hold up, what? The scene is crafted so, so well. Carol even puts on that oven timer to have that ticking noise in the background. Which in cinema is basically the universal way of showing uneasiness, and that works absolutely wonderfully here. But following this, the attack begins in full swing with Molotovs flying over the walls and dozens more swarming Alexandria. And I'll just say it right now, the super cool Andrea and Rick moment at the gates is great and all, but I far preferred how the wolves were handled. It felt so, so much more tense, especially because these people were just full-on feral. And I think you'll agree that both Morgan and Carol were absolute beasts in this episode, and I am all here for it. And I think the whole duality of their approach also worked really well. Both are extremely strong and single-handedly take out a solid number of the wolves. The only difference is that Morgan's a pacifist, while Carol is in full-on killing mode. So yeah, really love these two in this episode. And we will have a chance to talk about Morgan plenty more later on. And obviously, since the wolves actually make it within the walls, a whole bunch more Alexandrians are attacked. Notably, Gabriel and Jesse, who goes ham with a pair of scissors. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really change much. The only real difference is that in the TV version, a whole bunch more background characters are killed off. But the net effect of the scavengers and the wolves will pretty much be the same, and you'll see what I mean in just a little bit. Hello, Editing Kuroto here. One additional note for the TV version is that Morgan takes Owen prisoner. Since all the scavengers were gunned down, this does not happen in the books. Again, it's a fairly minor change that, in the grand scheme of things, will not change anything, but you'll see what I mean when we get further on. But returning to the book for a second, following the encounter at the gates, and with the funerals once again having to be postponed, we see Rick go to talk to Douglas about addressing the community as their leader. Douglas, on the other hand, says that putting Alexandria in the clock tower was his idea, and without her, they would have been in so much more danger. And he basically just explains that he is no longer fit to lead, and rather, the community needs Rick. And so with that, Rick basically becomes the formal leader of Alexandria. And following this, we'll have our first ever rapid fire changes round, as there are a few minor events that are just being set up here. First off, we see Aaron and Eric return from a run where Eric got stabbed. And following this, Aaron would go to Douglas saying that they would no longer be going outside of the wall searching for people, saying that it's simply too dangerous. In the TV version, it's Rick who'd say that they'd no longer accept people in, and Aaron had absolutely nothing to do with that. Next up, we continue to see Morgan and Michonne getting closer and closer, and their relationship was simply removed outright in the adaptation. Unless you consider their protein bar banter as a form of relationship, because in that case, it is far, far stronger in the adaptation, because it just doesn't exist in the books. Though very similar to the adaptation, Rick keeps getting closer with Jesse, but Andrea basically functions as the TV version of Michonne. She's just a loyal friend who's always got Rick's back. But alright, for now, those are the rapid fire differences wrapped up. But while we're still speaking about the comic book, winter is once again here. And yes, if you've been around since the season 1 and 2 videos, you'll know that I'm an absolute sucker for seeing winter time in the series. 
So it probably shouldn't come as a surprise that I enjoyed much of what follows this point quite a bit more in the books. Though that aside, we see that walkers are becoming more and more of an issue. As even after clearing out the waves regularly, they just keep coming. So in response, multiple squads are sent out to try and take out as many of the walkers as possible. Only for them to turn a corner and see a massive horde stumbling up to the walls. And with that said, No Way Out is basically here. But taking a step back for a moment, the thing I enjoy about the winter time here specifically so much is that it adds so much more complexity to the story. Things like heating now become an issue. Growing food is impossible, it just gets dark so much faster, just to name a few. And then stack a horde at your gates on top of that, it's just the perfect mix of apocalyptic dangers. So in this case, I'm sorry, the TV show doesn't even come close to the comic book. We'll of course talk about it a lot more in the following videos, but the difference of this whole thing taking place during the winter time is seriously massive. Returning to the adaptation, the Walker Diversion mission is still going on, and we see Abe and Sasha kiting a part of the Horde away. This is setting up their romantic relationship later in the series, and is also a sort of a remix from the books, where Big Man Abe did not act like a big man and cheated on Rosita with Holly. Since we'll get a pretty much whole focus episode on them later in the season, we'll talk about them more there. So for now, just keep that in mind. Meanwhile, the other group, led by Michonne and Glenn, are forced to hold up in a pet store, while the walkers swarm the entire building. And this is where the episode, in my opinion, goes completely off the rails, and not in the fun way. We do get some great character-centric moments while they're stuck in the store, I'll be the first to admit that, and it's not even just from our main cast. Though clearly, all of that is overshadowed by Glenn, who just so happens to tick literally all the boxes of I'm about to die even going as far as to very explicitly check Herschel's watch while referencing the Good luck, dumbass. Dumbass. You already know exactly what I'm talking about, so we'll get to that in just a second. Because we then cut to Rick, who doesn't really do anything super important or anything, but I just really love the sequence. The whole him pulling out a knife from one of the walkers and continuing to use it as a weapon was a great showcase of how experienced he is in terms of combat nowadays. Though yeah, there's really not much aside from that, it's just a really cool scene in my opinion. Especially considering that he is the only one who's absolutely solo, everyone else is at least a duo or has an entire squad, so this is just Rick being an absolute chad. Though we then get back to the pet store. Or, more specifically, Glenn and Nicholas splitting off from the group in an attempt to burn down a store to direct the Horde. And again, you know how much I love urban environments, so this sort of suburb at least did have me very excited on first viewing. And remembering how good just the previous episode was, I was already thinking that wow, Season 6 is off to an incredible start. Which by all accounts it was, and still is. That is, of course, if it wasn't for the dumpster incident. We see Glenn and Nicholas get absolutely swarmed, then they get up on this dumpster and basically have zero chance of getting it out of there. And even if you ignore the whole none of the walkers for some reason being able to grab neither one of them in the first place, the show then decides to do the old bait and switch, as we see Nicholas go bonk, as they both fall into the horde. Now I'll admit, the cinematography here with the whole first person view, which we don't see too often, along with the absolutely tragic death that this would have been, was brilliant. Very bittersweet, but brilliant. And the remainder of this episode, as you'd expect, is also a lot more somber. Remembering the whole I'm going to die soon spiel that we saw in the pet store, the show used every single way, both in the form of narrative tools that super casual viewers wouldn't even pick up on, as well as obviously very blatantly showing you that absolutely by any measure whatsoever, 
Glenn dies, but he does not. Now don't get me wrong, as I've probably said about 50 times in the series, Steven Yoon's Glenn is literally one of the best things the adaptation ever had. But I'm sorry, this was cheap writing. Like, really cheap. There are fake-out deaths, and then there's this. Obviously when we found out that he had in fact lived, as I think most people were, I was very happy. It's when my critical brain tuned in that I couldn't help but feel like it was just a cheap ploy to get into the headlines. Unlike a lot of people, I don't think fake-out deaths are that taboo. As long as you handle them right, I think they can be used as a great subversion of expectations, especially if there are already conflicting clues to the character's true fate, which you can piece together beforehand to understand what really happens. Think Stranger Things. I'm obviously not gonna spoil it, but if you know, you know. But in Glenn's case, I'm sorry, there should have been zero chance of survival there. Neither by him getting covered in guts or anything. They fell into the hands of countless walkers. He would have been toast. So it's not just a fake-out death. It's also a fake-out death with plot armor stronger than Steven Yoon's alter ego Invincible. Even very, very small things like Rick trying to reach him on the radio. Why did the walkers ignore that? It was obviously noise coming from somewhere. Also, when has fresh blood ever worked as a disguise? That is literally what the walkers are attracted to. And if Glenn could fit under the dumpster, why didn't the walkers? That is literally what happened with the tank in the very first episode. There are so, so many problems with this that I just can't. If they revealed his survival in the same episodes, I genuinely think most people could look past it. But because it was dragged out not across one, but multiple weeks, I genuinely cannot find a better explanation aside from the aforementioned greed. And that is a big no-no. You have to respect your audience's intelligence if you want them to take you seriously. And that is also exactly the same reason why I think people hated the cliffhanger at the end of the season. Though let's not open that can of worms just yet. We do get another sequence in the adaptation that I want to talk about. And that's us cutting back to Rick in the RV, where he is attacked by the wolves who Morgan let get away. In a meta sense, obviously this is just a handy way of tying up that loose end, but I still think it makes for an absolutely awesome moment. We see him take out the two who charge him in the RV, but then spot another group in the mirror. And that's when he goes full auto, spraying all of them down through the wall of the RV. And taking a step back for a moment, this is one of those things that in retrospect makes season 7 and 8 seem so much dumber when it comes to gunfights. Obviously we'll talk about this plenty more when we get there, but we've had countless examples like this where Rick and the others have a very good amount of combat sense. Whereas in the All Out War arc, that is foregone for the sake of plots. Though yeah, as I think I've said a lot this video, that is another rabbit hole that we'll be delving into in the future. I just wanted to say this scene was cool. And alright, there is actually one more detail in the adaptation that I want to talk about. And that is the shift in cinematography that we're beginning to see here. I don't know if this was actually a conscious decision or not, but from this point on, more and more you'll notice that we're starting to get these wide panning shots. Almost as if it were trying to tell you that there is a much larger world out there, and our main cast is comparatively tiny. They do just make for some beautiful shots, especially some of these with Daryl, but I do think it also works in the grander narrative with what we see later in the season. Though with that said, we see that Rick's part of the Horde has now been pulled toward Alexandria in a very similar manner to that of the books. So, we have a very similar situation brewing in both versions. A massive amount of walkers is slowly but surely making their way to the walls. And it's here where we'll pick up next time, as trying to squeeze in the rest of the lead up to No Way Out in this video is not a sane thing to do. So, to quickly summarize the differences, in the book, no one aside from Andrea who's in the clock tower is outside of Alexandria. Also, there were never any hordes pulled anywhere or anything like that, 
the scavengers were quickly defeated, and the gunfire simply drew the walkers in Washington toward Alexandria. In the adaptation, on the other hand, a substantial part of the heavy hitters are outside of the walls, and are either still kiting the herd or, after being severely injured, making their way back to Alexandria. Also, as of this moment, Glenn is pseudo-dead, which never happens in the books. Kirkman has said that he had some plans to kill Glenn while they were out on the supply run in issue 75, so this may be an homage to that. But in the books, nothing as ridiculous as him crawling under a dumpster happens, and there were no real hints of him dying at all. And so with that, next time we'll be delving into the super interesting TV show exclusive Morgan storyline, as well as the final lead up to the famous No Way Out. And that's the video. Oh boy, you've got no idea how excited I am to be delving into season 6. Expect a lot of very, very long videos, especially once a particular bat-wielding gentleman comes into the picture. Though as always, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And speaking of which, let us give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Mate Vuk and OAS. I'm sorry if I butchered the pronunciation, but regardless, seriously, thank you, thank you. And if you wish to join the highly coveted Mystery Shack Insiders Club and support the channel even further, you can do so for as little as $1 per month. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye